Today, we are starting a brand new series that's called The Red Letters. And the reason this series is called The Red Letters, in a lot of different Bibles, the words of Jesus, uh, the sayings of Jesus, the things he said in the Gospels are recorded in red letters. Does anybody have a Bible that has red letters in it? So this series, what we're going to be doing for the next many, many weeks to come is we're going to be looking at the different teachings of Jesus and the parables of Jesus one by one. And this week, we're going to dive into a subject that has a really strong paradox to it. In fact, if you're familiar with the teachings of Jesus, one thing he used a lot was this thing called a paradox. I love paradoxes. Let me just give you the definition, in case you're not familiar with it, with what a paradox is. A paradox is this. Here's the definition. A seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. So basically, it's a statement that can initially seem to contradict itself, but when you really examine it, it has elements of truth to it. Two separate parts that seem incapable of being true, but yet when you put them together and you look at the whole, they realize that they contain an element of truth. So, if you don't know what a paradox is, and maybe you read the definition, you're still going, I'm not sure what a paradox is. Let me give you a few examples of what paradoxes can be. Maybe you've heard of some of these. The first one is this. If I know one thing, it's that I know nothing. You ever heard that before? Okay. Here's another one that's pretty common. This is the beginning of the end. I I like the third one. This one's really good. It It says this, deep down, you're really shallow. I don't know why you're all laughing. Be nice, we're Christians. This one is actually from Socrates, and it's actually very true. I say this all the time because it's actually true. The more you learn, the more you realize how little you know. You feel like that? I mean, the older I get, the more I used to think I knew everything in my 20s and teens. The older I get, the more I realize I don't know much at all. Here's another one. The only constant is change. And then this last one is for a select group of you here that I know believe this with all your heart. It's for you shopaholics among us. And it's this, I save money by spending it. You ever had that before? Like, you know, I went out and spent all this money, but you should have seen what I saved. Oh my gosh, it was incredible. And see, the title of our message today and and the scriptures we're going to be looking at have a very strong paradox to them. And the title of today's sermon is this, you must die in order to live. You must die in order to live. You see, Jesus came to give us life and give us life to the full. And he comes and invites us to experience that fullness of eternal life that he invites us into. But in the midst of that invitation, there's another invitation to come and to die. So let me take us to the passage that that talks about this principle, but let me set it up beforehand. We're going to go to the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter, but let me give you some context of what's happened before I read what Jesus shares with us. See, Jesus' popularity is at an all-time high. Uh, primarily because of the, the resurrection of miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. The word has got out that Jesus performs incredible miracles. His popularity has reached an all-time high. He is coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. He is being greeted with, Hosanna, Hosanna, the king has arrived. He, he is at the pinnacle of his popularity. Everybody wants to see him. He comes into Jerusalem, and, and the people are greeting him, potentially as the coming king. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. The crowds are enthralled with Jesus. Word had gotten out. He's an amazing teacher. He works miracles. Maybe he's the coming Messiah to deliver us from Roman oppression. And there was a lot of people in Jerusalem for the Passovers, and there were some, some Greeks, some Jewish Greeks from out of town, and they talked to one of the disciples, and they wanted to, to come and speak to Jesus. So they come to speak to Jesus, and Jesus has some really interesting things to share with them. So let me read this, John chapter 12, verses 23 through 26. I'm reading out of the ESV version today. Here's what Jesus says. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant also be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. See, Jesus knows he's headed to the cross to face his imminent death. And in verse 23, he lets us know something. It is time for the Son of Man, for Jesus, to be glorified. He says that. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. See, Jesus was in perfect sync with God's timeline. Jesus was in perfect sync with what God wanted to do in, in eternity and through history. He was living right in the divine moment that he was appointed to fulfill. And he's saying this, he's saying, the time has come for me to be glorified. Remember, he was just hailed as, as being a king, possibly, being invited in, Hosanna, Hosanna, by all the people. And now he's saying it's time for him to be glorified. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean they're going to bring him into the temple? They're going to finally crown him as king? He'll raise up an army to overthrow the Roman oppression? That's what a lot of the Jewish people were waiting for, that kind of Messiah. That's a glorification. But see, in verse 24, he starts to explain what entering into glory would look like for him and his mission and what he'd been called to do. And what he does is he uses a grain of wheat as an illustration of what's about to happen to him. See, the Lord Jesus refers to himself as, as a grain of wheat. Maybe you can't see that if you're online with us today. It may be very difficult to see this because this is pretty, pretty small. Jesus says he's like a kernel or, or a grain of wheat. And he explains that a single seed must, must fall into the ground, must fall into the ground and, and die if he does that, he says, then it will produce harvest, it will produce life, it will bear much fruit. That phrase, bear much fruit, in a lot of other translations is directly translated, it will bring a harvest. See, he, see, he says, he must die, be buried, then be resurrected, and his life will produce an incredible harvest. Jesus is proclaiming what he's about to do using this illustration as a grain of wheat. And actually, if you think about the harvest that his life produced, it's, it's amazing. Last 2,000 years of church history, the billions of believers that have come in to serve him, to lay their lives down for Jesus. In fact, the, the reason we're here this morning, the life that we're, we're living right now, the reason we're gathered here today under the banner and the name of Jesus to glorify him, you are a part of the harvest that Jesus came to purchase. You're a part of his life. You're a part of the harvest he was talking about. But see, then he does this shift. He's clearly initially talking about himself, his life, his mission, the glorification, the timeline. It's very clear he's talking about himself. But then he pivots. He pivots in verses 25 and 26. And he brings the focus then to us. He takes this principle and then clearly applies it to us. Let me read verses 25 and 26 again. I want you to listen to them because they're, they're applied to you, applied to me. It says this, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, my father will honor him. See, he's teaching us this principle and he's using this really powerful paradox that he's demonstrating through his own life. I love verse 25 because it's just one giant paradox. Whoever loves his life loses it and whoever hates his life in this life, in this world, will keep it for eternal life. What he says right there is so initially just seemingly contradictory, counterintuitive and countercultural that I'm sure that those who heard it initially were baffled. In fact, you may hear it this morning and go, I have no idea 
what Jesus is talking about. I mean, think about what he just said there. If you love your life, you'll, you'll lose it. I mean, let's just take for example, if I'm coming out here in the morning before service and I'm saying hi to people and I go, hey, Jeremiah, how was your week? And he's like, oh man, I am loving life. I would genuinely rejoice for you. I'd be like, really? That's awesome. You're loving life? We all want to be at that place where we're saying, I am just loving life. That's not a bad thing. So if I saw Jeremiah and said, man, I am loving life, I would literally rejoice with him and be like, that's fantastic. But then in contrast, you have Jesus saying this, whoever loves his life loses it. And then he goes on, in typical Jesus fashion, he always has the gift to upping the ante. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it. Not just loving life, you'll lose it, but whoever hates his life in this world will lose it. See, the one thing I've learned with Jesus and walking with him for a while, that if you hang out with him for long enough, you'll definitely get to the point where he invites you in to know and understand there's some very hard truths to embrace. And the principle today that we're learning is you must die in order to live. It's what Jesus is teaching us. I'll explain that a little bit more about what I, I mean from that, but I want you to look at verse 26 because he says something there that I think we can easily overlook, but you have to look at it again in the context of what he's saying. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am. Think about what he just said. Think about the context that he's saying it in. He, he says this, if you want to serve me, you actually have to follow me. If you profess to serve me and to live a life committed to me, you actually have to be in close proximity to where I am. It means you can't really serve Jesus unless you're going where he's going. And it's clear that in this context, Jesus is going to the cross. Jesus is going towards his imminent death. And he says, if you're going to serve me, you have to follow me also. I'm sure when the disciples finally realized what was happening to Jesus, that he was headed towards the cross, I'm sure the disciples could think, man, thank heavens I don't have to do that myself. But then Jesus says, follow me. He says, if you're really going to serve me, you will be where I am also. And Jesus is headed to the cross. And he invites us to the same thing. And it isn't for service. It's something that's chosen. It's a willing service to Christ based out of love simply because you want to be close to Jesus. See, we can have a lot of different motives for serving Jesus. We can have a lot of different motives for even following him. And one thing I love about the grace of God is he covers all of our motives, whether pure or impure. But I think the ultimate motive in serving and following Jesus should be love. And it is love that will compel you to go with him when he heads to the cross. See, that's a really intense invitation. I understand that. But, but let's just ask the question. In this context, what is, what is Jesus inviting us to die to? I mean, clearly, we're in a room here. We'll make some assumptions that the majority of us here are followers of Jesus already. And Jesus is inviting us to come and die. But when I look out in this room, the majority of you look like you're alive. Overwhelming majority, just so I'll be kind, okay? So I'm looking at this room, and Jesus is saying, if you, if you lose your life, you'll find it, and you need to come and die. Come and follow me. Come, I'm headed to the cross. But yet, we're in a room full of people that are mostly alive. Now, granted, when you got out of bed this morning, you may not have felt alive. You may get out of bed and there's a snap, crackle, pop, all these things happening with your body, and you may go, I don't know how I feel about being alive, but you're breathing and you're alive. So what kind of death is Jesus inviting you into? See, it's this principle of dying to live. See, it's dying to a life that lives revolved around us. It's dying to a life that is fundamentally rooted in our self, in selfishness. See, it's dying to a life that makes us to be the center of our own universe, and a life that makes us 
the captain of our own ship and the author of our own destiny. It's in contrast to the message of the world. I love listening to leadership and motivational stuff and I'll listen to that stuff a lot. And a lot of times you'll hear people say, hey, you're the author of your own destiny. You gotta do this and you gotta do that. And sometimes the underlying principles can be true. You need to take uh, authority over your life. You need to make wise choices. But in this call to discipleship, it is, it is a call of surrender. It is a call to a life that then revolves around you based out of a love relationship for him, living a life of sacrifice and obedience to Jesus. You make him the boss. You ask him to be Lord. See, he, he speaks of a death to our own self-serving interests. And maybe a death to the things that we feel like we deserve, the rights we feel like we must have, and the things that we need to own in order to be happy. But see, a life that is surrendered to Jesus will do so because you actually just want to be in close proximity to the one that we profess to serve and to follow. Maybe it's a death of a dream. I don't know if you've been at a point in your life where you've, you've had a dream and you came to the point where you realize this is not gonna happen. And you actually, maybe you walk through a time of grief where you let that, that dream die. Maybe it's the death of a pursuit of something because Jesus calls you somewhere else. Maybe you have written the own plan for your life. Maybe you have decided to be the author of your own destiny, but now Jesus is challenging you, Jesus is calling you, Jesus is inviting you into something more, and in that call, there's a challenge. Do I have it my way, or do I surrender and want to be close to Jesus and follow him to where he is calling me? And let's be clear, that call, when he asks you to come and follow him, that call comes with sacrifice. That call comes with costs. I love in the NIV study Bible, the note on this verse says this, we must disown the tyrannical rule of our own self-centeredness. You see, the basis of our sinful nature, apart from the, the work of the Spirit of God, apart from the redeeming and sanctifying work of God in our life, that nature apart from Christ is extremely self-centered. One of the fundamental root sins is pride, which is selfishness. Everything is about us. And as we choose to walk with Christ, as we choose to hopefully press into maturity, what happens is he starts to flip us inside out. Tells us things such as the greatest among you will be the least and be the servant of all. And then he models what that looks like. It's this process where we're being conformed and formed and challenged to become more and more like Jesus. By the way, that's the definition of maturity in your life. Are you becoming more and more like Jesus on a daily and weekly and monthly basis? But see, I think the reason that we can give in to selfishness and pride because I think we have a built-in instinct for self-preservation. In fact, I love America. I make no mistake about it, truly I do. We live in a nation with just amazing freedoms. Regardless of what you think, you need to go travel. We still have some amazing freedoms in this country. We, we are blessed. But in the midst of living in this incredible amount of freedom that we get to enjoy, uh, what we've learned is we've, we've become a nation that loves comfort and convenience and ease. Do you realize that? So much of our society is driven by how much ease and how much comfort, how much of, of, of my own comfort, which is about me, can I have? And let me be clear, I'm not saying I'm above that. I'm right there with you in the midst of it. In fact, I can give you a, an illustration if you want to hear it about how much I love comfort. Do you want to hear it? Okay, I'm going to tell you anyway if you didn't want to. I love comfort. In one way, I love comfort in the form of comfort food, specifically ice cream. Ice cream ministers to my soul. It's like a kind of a quasi-quiet time. You know, and, and, and I've gotten better. I actually just went off the rails last night, ate a ton of ice cream, but I've been pretty good about cutting back in the last year or so. But there were several years there where I was an ice cream addict, much to my wife's chagrin. 
And, and what, what we had is we had a, a, fr a freezer-fridge combo in the kitchen and a freezer-fridge combo in the garage. And I learned that when I had ice cream in the kitchen that the kids would get into it and it would just get you know, devoured overnight. And I'd go, oh man, we're out of ice cream again. I'm gonna have to go buy it and try to get this by my wife and put it in there so I won't get in trouble because she wants me to be healthy. But then I learned something. You know, if you get this ice cream and you go hide it in the freezer in the garage and you put a bunch of vegetables around it, no one knows it's there. <laughs> so there was a season where I would get really, really, really to the point where I would volunteer to take out the trash all the time. Honey, do you need me to take the trash out there? Oh, that'd be great. I'll take it in the garage. I'll put it in the bins out there. And I get a spoon, true story, stick it in my back pocket. I'd get the garbage and I go put it out in the garage and then I look around and I go dig out my ice cream and I take the lid off and just sit there and I just eat it, and I'm so happy. Comfort, ease, self-preservation, the captain of my own destiny, just sitting there eating it, and then selfishly squirreling it away so no one gets it. Until one day I come home and my wife's like, hey, I've got a question for you. Uh, I'm just curious as to why I found a half gallon, a half eaten half gallon of Bluebell ice cream shoved in the freezer in the garage. And I was like, those stinking kids, man, I can't believe them. <laughs> Those guys, you got to keep your eye on the kids. But, I, but I'm joking, but I'm actually not. I, I really did do that, okay? Don't judge me. You've done something similar. I know you love donuts. It's okay. But seriously, I mean, at the end of the day, I love comfort just like the rest of you. I know the ice cream is not going to be good for me. I'm sitting there not even using a bowl, you guys, because a bowl kind of tells you how much you've eaten. If you eat it out of the half gallon, you really don't know how much you've eaten. That's a pro tip. Pro tip right there. But what's my point? I love comfort like the rest of you. I love comfort, food. And when I was eating my little bit of ice cream in the garage, I was loving life. We all have things built in our society that pull us into this desire for comfort and ease. But listen to this. Comfort isn't God's goal for your life. Changing you into the person who is like his son is his plan for your life. I wish I could tell you that's easy and comfortable, but it's not. Because Jesus has this call, he says, you must follow me to where I'm going. And Jesus is going to die, the cross. And he gives us an invitation to do the same thing. See, he asks us to detach from this life, abandon ourselves to him, his plans, his calling, his purposes on our life. He asks us to come and die to ourselves. The apostle Paul lived this principle out perfectly. In fact, in, in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he's talking about the resurrection of the dead. He's talking about uh, how one day we'll have resurrected bodies. He'll come back as the glorious and conquering king. One day we'll get to experience that eternal life. And in that context, listen to what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 15, 30, 31. He says this, why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. See, Paul was abandoned to live out this calling to follow Jesus wherever Jesus called him to go. And in the midst of him planning churches and, and, and living for Jesus, if you know what happened to Paul, he had to sacrifice tremendously Lots of persecution in his life in order to abandon himself to the call of where Jesus asked him to go. And it's the same call that Jesus invites us to. He says, if you're going to come and follow me, then you need to come and die to yourself. So I want to invite a couple of friends of mine up here this morning. Uh, Jordan and Ashley, would you welcome Jordan and Ashley this morning as they come up and share? Go ahead and stand up here with me, guys. It's good to have you. So Jordan and Ashley came to our church several months ago. They're new members. And uh, would you guys just kind of briefly tell us a little bit about yourselves and your family? Yeah, for sure. So um, as you introduced us, Jordan and Ashley Odell, um, we've got two little kiddos, uh, Holly, she's six, and Hudson is three. And we've got one more T minus six months or so. Woo! Um, Bacon. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so awesome. Ash awesome. is uh, able to stay home with our kids, and uh, I'm an engineer. 
engineer, awesome. So as I'm, I'm taking us through this principle of that you must die in order to live, um, would you all mind just sharing with me a little bit about, I know some of your story and how this has kind of played out for you, but would you mind sharing with our church what this kind of principle and calling from Jesus has ended up looking like for you and your family? Yeah, so several years ago now, um, we kind of went through a time in our life where God really changed our, or woke us up to how our priorities were quite a bit out of balance. Um, As you were saying, you know, it's very easy to get caught up in uh, pursuing comfort and ease. And uh, yeah, so we had a pretty pretty comfortable life. um, And we were kind of convicted and, you know, how are we living by faith? How are we um, actually following God? You know, we believed in God, but it's one thing to believe in him and a different thing to actively follow him with your life. Um, so, yeah, and, <laughs> <sorry>. <laughs> and we just were looking at our life and realizing that we weren't showing any fruit for, you know, we claimed to follow the Lord, but there was nothing to show for that, and that felt very convicting. Yeah, so... Um, what that looked like for us was um, we first kind of made a step to, uh, yeah, get, get engaged and more actively involved in what he's doing. And one of the things we did was get into foster care. Um, and so we did that for a bit. And that was a big uh, sacrifice on, your, you know, time and energy um, just to invest in that. If you've ever been involved in that, um, you know what we're talking about. And so we did that for a season. Um, Then when Ashley got pregnant with Hudson, we kind of had to hit pause on that and transition to uh, investing in uh, refugee uh, ministries here in Tucson. Um, And so that was, you know, there's in, at the end of Titus, it talks about Um, devoting ourselves to meeting urgent needs so we don't live unfruitful lives. And there's urgent physical needs and there's urgent spiritual needs and fosters a very urgent physical need for the child. Um, And there is a spiritual component there as well, obviously. Um, With refugee ministries, you know, many refugees come from a Muslim background. The, uh, you know, our current government set up, the government actually cares for their physical needs uh, pretty well. Um, and so, but there's very immense uh, spiritual needs there in that, you know, Muslims generally have very low access to the gospel. Um, and many are coming from groups in the world that are unreached people groups. Um, and so their community of people um, generally just have very low access to the gospel. So um, that's a cool way to invest in what God's doing. Um, so we jumped into that and very quickly realized, you know, we lived up in Oro Valley at the time. I worked over on the east side. So I'd be driving through Midtown to go to work, come back through Midtown where many refugees live and um, get all the way back to Oro Valley, pack up our kids and drive back into Midtown to um, then try and engage with this community and realized this just logistically isn't, isn't going to work. And so God kind of led us to making a move. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think it was something we were really realizing is it's really difficult to be in community with people when you're not in that community, um, living life with people and walking life with people. You, you just have to have like, it's like that proximity principle. You know, you need to be close to the people that you're trying to love. And these are cultures that aren't structured like ours. <laughs> you don't set a play date, you know, a week out, and it's like, okay, we're going to, you know, meet for two hours or whatever, right? That's just not how they roll. Um, so they want to be able to show up and, you know, uh, bring meat over and grill at, you know, it's like, well, it's 8 o'clock, you know, we're <laughs> putting our kids down, but sure, let's fire up the grill, right? Um, and so... Yeah, so we, that led us to move, and the first move opportunity we had was to come down and live in some apartments where we knew other refugees lived. Um, so me and Ashley and Holly and Hudson, who Hudson was, you know, nine yeah, nine months, so very little at the time, moved into a, a small two-bedroom apartment. And um, to do that, we kind of looked at all this stuff. You know, if you have a house, 
you accumulate stuff and <laughs> it just happens, right? And so you get attached to some of that stuff and so we had to look at it and be like, okay, realistically, we've got to have everything we have to fit in this apartment. We did that and then it was like, oh, we still got to have it again because <laughs> we're still not going to fit. Um, and so that was, uh, yeah. Well, I think the important thing also is like, I feel like we kind of felt the chains of, of earthly goods fall as we went through that. Because as you're going through your things, you just begin to realize like, this is just stuff. It's stuff. And um, you learn to live with so much less. Um, and I think there's a lot of pruning of your heart when you have to go through a process like that. Mm. Yeah, and so um, that was the first uh, move we made down to this part of town, um, and so that that was really good. There was uh, families in that neighbor or in the apartments, we had a little table out front, and the kids would come and sit out there, and um, yeah, it was a really good time to engage with people. Um, and then the refugee ministry we're involved in was renting a house, and we had. Uh, two younger guys living there at the time and were using part of the house and the garage for English classes and different things we were doing for refugees, tutoring, kids club. yeah, kids club. And uh, anyways, one of them got married and moved out and so there was kind of a reshuffling in what we were doing and so we had the opportunity to kind of move in as the host family um, to that house and that's, uh, that's where we're at now. And you guys are doing that now? That's yeah. what we're doing now. Yeah. So. I love that. <laughs> yeah, just one more quick thing. And I, I think it just, in, in all of this, there's, like you were saying, like a daily decision to die to yourself. And sometimes that's harder than others. And, but just realizing that, like, our discomfort is worth their salvation. Mm. And um, really thinking about what that means and um, just being willing to die to your earthly goods for treasure in heaven. I love that. Can y'all give them a hand? I appreciate y'all sharing this morning. It's awesome. Thank you. I love that. I love that story. I mean, if you think about that, um, you know, Oro Valley, if you've been up there, Oro Valley is a nice area. You know, he's a, he's a great engineer, and uh, that's a comfortable life, really comfortable life, right? And then to move from a house in Oro Valley to an apartment and half your stuff and then half it again, just because you want your life to count for something in the midst of eternity and to invest your life into where Jesus is calling you to go. I love that illustration. I don't, I don't think it gets any better than that. And, and your life, like Jesus said, is like a kernel of wheat. You can invest this in, in one area or another. You have one life to live. You have one shot. It's like a kernel of wheat and and the Lord will look at us and go, how are you going to invest this unto eternal life? What are you doing with your life? Are you taking this kernel and living for yourself, living for your own pleasures, living for you? Or are you taking this, this life that God has given you? And are you willing to sow it into the ground? And maybe it's a process of you die daily, as Paul said, making choices to not live for yourself and making the choice to follow Jesus no matter where he is calling you. See, it's through dying to yourself that God is inviting you to experience a harvest that produces eternal life. See, you got to ask yourself, this, this teaching I know is not an easy one. It's a hard call from Jesus, but why in the world would you make the choice to go and die to yourself. Like, why would you do that? Why would you want to do that? Well, he tells us right there in the teaching because he wants your life to produce a harvest. Do you realize that your life can produce a harvest that echoes throughout the timeline of eternity? You have one life to live and Jesus is calling you to invest it in such a way that brings a harvest. And that harvest can look a bunch of different ways. It can maybe just start with the fact that you actually start to experience the life that Jesus came to purchase and give you. Sometimes I meet Christians and I just go, there's so much more than what you're experiencing now. You're bound up. You're bound up and you're not experiencing the fullness of life that Jesus has called you through. 
Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, allowing the Spirit of God to manifest His fruit in your life so you start to experience the life He's called you to. Maybe what Jesus is asking you to do is just to detach yourself from some of the sin that's entangling you. See, there's stuff that you're holding on to because it's comfortable, it gives you pleasure, it meets an immediate need, and you're holding it with one hand and you're trying to follow Jesus with the other and it's pulling you and you feel divided. And again, I go back and say, you have one shot, you have one life to live. I'll tell you one thing, you will never regret if you sow this seed into the soil of a life with Jesus, it will produce a harvest that only he can bring. And he's calling you to yield your life and to sow it in to him. But how is that done? See, dying to live is done through sacrifice and surrender. Dying to live, this death he's calling us to, is done through sacrifice and surrender. We saw that with Jordan and Ashley in their story. So dying to live is done through sacrifice and surrender, and it's through sacrifice and surrender that we're invited to experience the harvest of full life that God offers to us. I'm going to go ahead and invite the worship team to come back up. So what is God inviting you into this morning? See, there's a life, there's a harvest that he has for you. There is a full life that he is inviting you into. There is more than what you're currently experiencing. There's an invitation from him. But what is holding you back? What is holding you back from investing your life? What is he calling you to die to? You can answer some of those questions sometimes by looking at what you spend your time on, what you spend your money on, what you spend your resources on, what do you think about the most? Those things that consume you oftentimes will point to where your heart is actually at. But there's this death to yourself, sometimes to your own desires, maybe to your own dreams, to your own, what you think is the own destiny that you need to offer, that Jesus calls you into. I'm gonna pray here in a second and my prayer is that as I pray, the Holy Spirit would specifically reveal to you what that thing is he's calling you to die to. But I wanna give you an invitation to something. Now, we have a missions trip coming up in October to Rocky Point. And I've met many people through the years that have been transformed because they decided to take a step of faith to go on mission to serve him in another country. And I wanna challenge you just to be open. God, maybe you're calling me to go on this three-day missions trip and to Rocky Point and, and just take a step out of my comfort zone to go serve you in another country. I'm gonna go sow my life into another culture, another people group that has a great need and see what you do. Because when you live out that principle, God is always faithful to bring a harvest. And I've seen it happen over and over and over again where that time of service becomes a catalyst of transformation. So I wanna challenge you. I wanna take a group of 10 people, y'all. We got a few right now. You can register online, there's, there's information in the back, but I'm, I am challenging you to get out of your comfort zone and come and die to yourself for your own comforts and to the fullness of life that God has for you. Let me pray for us this morning. Jesus, I lift up each and every person in this room. Right now, Holy Spirit, we invite your sovereign, and powerful work in our lives. Would you reveal to us right now, Lord, the areas of our life that maybe we're clinging on to because they're full of comfort or they're full of ourselves or they're full of our own desires, Lord, that, that you are clearly pinpointing, your, your finger is laid upon that area. Would you call us into your life to experience the harvest unto eternal life that you are inviting us into, Lord. Right now, we stand against fear of doing that because perfect love casts out fear. Lord, you love us so much. You actually only have the best life in store for us, even though it may not be easy. So Lord, would you woo us and call us right now by your love into a life 
that desires to go where you're going, to die as you ask us to die, that we may live and yield a harvest that makes the name of Jesus famous in our lives and our city. Everybody said, Amen. Would you stand?